Hello everyone, welcome to the St. Lotus recap of the St. Lotus Presents number five. We're here with Brandon and we're going to be talking about his draft and how it all ended up. I'm Mark Haderberg. I'm Brandon. And yeah, we're going to be talking through this draft that we finished up, uh, what, a couple weeks ago at this point? Uh, and yeah. hearing about how it went for you. Uh, it went very well for me. So this, uh, I guess I've done two of these VRDs since uh, the last year, since the city championships between St. Louis and Chicago. Um, the previous one, I think you guys were down a couple people. Um, and I was like, I mean, you know, I'm around, so I'll show up. Um, and I ended up getting ancestral in the first uh, round. And yep. it's just not, it's just not my vibes. It's just too good. So uh, I think I have either taken mana crypt in five out of the last seven drafts or like out of uh in seven out of the last seven have had the opportunity to take it with my first pick sure and every time i've taken mana crypt uh <laughs> over lotus or over recall i've had a much better time um and so once again i i had the first pick of draft seat and i was just like throw it up there give me seat three <laughs> i'm punting lotus and recall uh, I'm just going to try to get Crypt and the best thing that can wheel. So that's what I went with. So yeah, you are also kind of burying the lead in that you went 5-2 and ended up winning the entire draft. So like you did very well uh, in the strategy. Yeah, yeah. And and okay, yeah. so, so the choice of taking the third seat in that spot. Um, obviously you wanted Crypt. That makes sense. You're very likely to get it in third seat. Uh, is the argument there that you just care about, uh, what is it, the uh, the 14th pick higher than the 16th pick and that wheel choice in the end? Yeah, it's basically that I don't know to this point uh, if in the last five or six years anybody has taken something other than low recall with the first two picks. And I don't see, it doesn't seem like we had a lot of uh, nonconformists in the crowd uh, to that kind of uh, right. recall loaded Jiminy. So I was just like, I'll get uh, two picks further up the line uh i kind of like just being in like a third seat or sixth seat yeah uh in general during these drafts i think uh the previous one of these drafts i won i was in seat six um it's uh, just kind of a more comfortable position to be in it lets you read you know one half of the draft versus the other Right, you don't have to um, the, the wheel. You basically have to read the entire draft where it gets back to you, but you do get the yeah. you do get the choice of the two in a row, which can't be disrupted. Right, and um, I don't know the eighth seat as has been discussed uh, at infinitum is just real tricky with double moxes and whether or not that's a good thing. Sure, but I went with mana crypt because going into the draft, I did have a plan, and I sent this list to Mason in advance. And it was a green Drazi list. Okay. Um, and I was very excited about it. I was like, oh, Modern Horizons 3 has some very cool things in store for this deck. I want to do stuff with Glaring Flesh Raker. And uh, the morning of the draft, or, yeah, uh, I I loaded it, in, loaded it into Goldfish, and it was not very good. <laughs> so That's amazing. I was like, all right. I'll make adjustments. Uh, we'll figure this out. Uh, but it definitely involved Mana Crypt. And then when Daniel, uh, who, this was his first one, I believe. Uh, Daniel in the AC. Yeah, Daniel Cardinal. Yep. Yeah. Um, and no shade to him at all. He did very well. He did. Um, and he's a good player. But understanding the meta certainly helps out. And especially if you're in mono white, you really lets you have the ability to sequence your picks in a certain way totally um for example like you know thalia is something that nobody else is going to draft if he's already demonstrated going down the line that he's in uh right. like white weenie or uh, death and taxes and then you know wasteland is a card that is can be floated significantly. right but white plume so, is, a, is obviously a pretty high pick right right and so with him passing on white plume and having the mana crypt I'm just like, all right. I mean, uh, it made it this far, and I'm just, uh, I'm going to rip it, see what happens. And uh, then Ancient Tomb was... Best friends with White Plume. 
I don't, you know, it didn't. Ancient Tomb is not a card that it looks like just even after a recall or Lotus that uh, Cody or Steven particularly want. Right. Uh, maybe in retrospect, it would have been a better pick to go with uh, Time Walk there since that also floated uh, longer than uh, I would have personally liked. But then um, I, at that point, in my mind, I think it was already gone and I was kind of locked in to uh, like, okay, well, the next pick should be this. Right. When in reality, it's like the next pick should be the time walk that floated to round three. So Yeah, your deck would have been uh, very different with a time walk in it, right? You either would have had to go a lot more mana or pivot out of the red at that point. Right, right. Um, I don't think I was fully aware of how much of an archetype uh, Red White Initiative has become uh, over the last year or two. Um, but I think, like, not necessarily pick for pick, but uh, like, at least of the first four, I think it mirrors uh, Daniel's uh, previous VRD draft almost identically. Yeah. And I, I mean... For the list I ended up drafting, I think these are pretty much exactly the cards that I wanted in the order that I wanted them. Absolutely. Um, Mox Diamond being available in round five was a really happy accident. Mm -hmm. um, it works tremendously well with the initiative because uh, you pitch a land to get it back when you play an initiative creature. That makes sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, any kind of acceleration is great. Um, and then I think based on pick order it looks like uh daniel picked up solitude and at that point fresh in my mind i said swords to plowshares and that kind of um established a pattern for me throughout the draft that i didn't even fully recognize until we started playing the matches which was that this deck more so than many of the other decks that i've drafted before had extremely efficient one drop or two drop removal yeah that was remarkably effective uh after having dropped uh you know uh some kind of three drop Monarch, whether it's initiative like, yeah anything whatever whatever it is um so yeah if you go down the list i end up with swords to plowshare lightning bolt uh, here, Red like, Elemental Blast. We just pulled the is, list but... over here. Yeah. Um, so March uh, even. Yeah, March uh, of Otherworldly Light, and um, I think I have some stuff out of my sideboard too. Uh, Orm's Chant is pretty solid, and a Reb as Reb. well. Um, and it's just uh, it's not something that I had. That I've had available traditionally in other in other drafts like this, where it felt like um, I'm very comfortable swinging out and passing the turn. Absolutely. And yeah, uh, I think we're getting down to this ninth pick, right? This is my biggest regret of the draft. Oh, the flage? Uh, or yeah, the flage was terrible. I sideboarded really? it out. I sideboarded it out immediately after uh, wow. every game people were really it, amped it, about that card uh yeah it's the mana is awkward with crypt and ancient tomb and city of traders mm -hmm. uh getting double red double white is like never happened. basically nobody else is in red white and the reason why this is such a mistake in my mind is because four rounds later daniel picks up caracas which is in that cycle of lands where everybody knows how powerful it is. Most of us have experienced being on the receiving end of the effect of an untapped land with a very powerful effect. And uh, you're just thinking, like, here are the cards in my archetype. Yeah. And uh, I think Flage would have been not only fine, but... Uh, really effective kind of uh like mid-game strategy uh to 
close out games if I had the Caracas. Okay. But, uh, you know, just playing it for three, bouncing it back to your hand. That makes playing sense. Playing it for three, bouncing it back to your hand. Yeah, just but, a four mana Lightning Helix with rebound. Yeah. yeah. And uh, my 46th pick, my Mr. Irrelevant, ended up being Lightning Helix, yep. which yep. was by, like, I don't know if that was actually in that should have been in my uh my main board i don't know if it, it was up on there yeah oh, you have you have it in your main uh and, I, and then you have the ability to get the scepter for it if you want to right um and it was it was so much better than flage interesting uh, do you think that uh like obviously flage you could take whatever you want right it's not like somebody else is going to be fighting you for it do you think that it has a spot in this type of deck or is it is it just that like your deck is so leaning on the the, the colorless mana and like maybe no, maybe in a it, field where there's lots of other small creature decks it's actually good or is it is it this field or is it just a bad card it's it's not a bad card i think that it belongs in a mardu shell oh, that okay not only has caracas but uh is playing small ball reanimator yeah like on earth um, and... yeah all of your creatures are under three uh cmc um you're using unearth you're using reanimate you're using colagon's uh, command precisely that makes um, sense it i think it fits in that shell it's very complimentary but uh red white initiative it is actively detrimental to have it in your hand I that makes like. sense it seems like it's yeah the deck is so tuned at this point that that's just not a card you need compared right. to something like athari yeah and then of course i take uh sensei's divining top because I honestly think that more so than any other card, that is really my pet card. Uh, I love doing all I'll the wacky, all all the wacky hijinks with it. Um, uh, you know, I, I take Monastery Mentor later in the draft, mm -hmm. and having a free uh, trigger for that every single turn while fixing your mana is just. Yeah, you, uh, you don't have any of the, like, untap effects that, that are the fun interaction with it, do you? Like, any keys? The classic uh, draw uh, two? No. Okay. It's... Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a solid... You don't really get a lot of card draw in red-white, so it's a, it's a good way to get out of that, too. You can yeah, drag and rage um, channeler and surveil it away. There's, there's little, little yeah. tricks. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Dragon's Rage Channeler is not a card that I really... I still don't fully understand uh, its power level, Same. but it is Delirium on a Stick is very, very good. I, I will say that, um, especially with all these zero drops where uh, it just, you know, with, with the Mana Crypt, with uh, the Mox Diamond, out of the sideboard Zurin Orb, I'm not really <laughs> suggesting that that's an effective use I don't of think so. <laughs> a slot. But, uh, you know, and with Sensei's Divining Top as a reusable one-mana version of that, um, yeah, it, it, it did a lot of work. And when you need to find a very specific card, mm -hmm. it helps you get there two times faster, three times faster in some instances. So can, let's, let's talk about some other like, specific cards in here. Gut is one yeah. that I feel like has gone up and down the list. It feels like it's kind of in that spot with... Uh, Rabble Master and um, Legion War Boss and a bunch of other three drop like even Lelia kind of falls into this world. Do you think Gut? Right that's obviously the big one, but I think that one's kind of an order above at this point in my head at least. Do you think I, that I, Gut deserves its spot in there? Is is it a card that's at the bottom end of there? Is it? Um, how did it perform? It definitely belongs. Uh, it, it's extremely effective in a list with Mana Crypt, yeah. not only because you can play it turn one um and because it gets rid of the mana crypt when you're kind of inching closer and closer to death uh in those uh, in those scenarios mm -hmm. um i don't know if this list I, I think that this list more so than others is well equipped to handle it and that's i think one of the uh synergies perhaps um that is hard to see from a top-down perspective, like when uh, you and Mason were doing the review on that. Um, so part of the reason that I take Goblin Rabble Master and Monastery Mentor... Tokens. ...is because those tokens go from 1-1 uh, little dirtily-doos 
into uh, four one menace uh, skeletons. Totally with and, haste. Yeah, and so uh, it is a way to take what is already uh, an extremely effective clock and turn it up uh, into an engine, essentially. Um, and so it. Uh, I don't know how many times it actually ended up showing up. I think, frankly, the, with <laughs> yeah, the the creature density is such that uh, you have interesting spots where you're deciding what three drop or what four drop to play when you get uh, a crypt in your opening hand or yeah. a soul land with a mox diamond, and it it it, it happens very regularly. That makes sense. So, uh, in those situations, you almost always want to drop white plume first, but you're also trying to bait out removal. Right. Um, and it is VRD, so there's always uh, three, usually four minimum uh, blue decks that are trying to bait out counter spells um, or that you know, that first turn days. So in those situations, I like, I like the glut yeah. of cards like, like gut, uh, like they're Leila, very replaceable. Like, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, um, the, the ones that have haste or essentially a, uh, an effect that starts taking place immediately. Sure. Uh, you know, Lelia, it, Lelia does what Lelia does, and getting her on board uh, as early as possible is is ideal. But uh, in, against a lot of decks, I found that I would rather play Archon of Amiri first as opposed to Gut. Um, okay. Yeah, Archon of Amiri was a, was a pick that I was fairly proud of, um, stealing it away from Daniel. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, I that card has blown me out <laughs> so many times where I want to do some real kitschy stuff and uh, they drop an Archon and I'm like, well, well, boys. Yeah, I've scooped uh, that card a lot. <laughs> it's it's yeah. very good. Um, yeah. Do you and think that, so, do you think Great Furnace or Ancient Den could have made the cut in your deck? Is that just a thing that like, you only have 46 picks, but it feels like with Gut, those cards would be fine unless you're really scared of uh, Wasteland and Blood Moon. I, I, didn't, I just don't really care enough about Gut. Got it. Um, being effective. Uh, when realistically it's probably a card that is getting cut when I'm going to sideboard against very specific matchups that such as um, such as Dan's uh, storm uh, slash thoracle list mm -hmm. um, like you get in, in those lists I go with the most efficient uh, clocks and if it's not that, then uh, it's getting cut for stuff like Orem's Chant or Piving Needle or right. Ferocity Moon Reaper. Like this, this doesn't disrupt, and it's no better clock than anything else on the table, so it's at the bottom of the list. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, is there anything about, about this deck that you think uh, you would change in a generic field, right? So like in, in this field, obviously, like there's some things that you drafted specifically for here, but if you were like right. to look at the shell, what are the cards that you think are like that you might want to cut. Gut might be one of them, but what other things in here would you swap out if you're considering no, other decks? I, I think that Gut gut does belong in the list. Sure, Flage sure. maybe not, uh, though. I, we, not even just against this field. It just it does not belong in this Got archetype. It. So, and, you know, we've gone over that where I would love to have a Caracas over that instead. Um, I, the list ended up being much tighter than I anticipated it would be. When mm -hmm. I ended up making my cuts and looking at my sideboard, I was like, this was not intentional, but this has worked out extraordinarily well. Uh, and I was very I was very pleased with, uh, with that. There's cards in the sideboard where I thought there may have been room for it. Uh, Slickshot Show Off is just, doesn't make any sense okay. in this deck. Uh, so that shouldn't be there. Um, the unexpectedly absent was used. That is my tech against um, what is it called? 
uh, against Oracle, which I actually got a game win off of using that on in Isochron Scepter. Uh, so that was one of my VRD checklist moments. That's amazing. Um, Wait, so, so go through that interaction, because obviously if there's no cards left in library and you put it on top, what happens? So, uh, especially against Daniel's list, uh, where he has no other blue permanent. Right. Uh, what happens is you cast Thoracle and you uh, let it hit play, and then in response to the trigger, you use uh, Demonic Consultation to name a card that's not in your library, exile your entire library, and then th uh, passes Oracle's trigger hits with zero cards in the library. Yep, and he wins the game. Uh, and you know, you're looking at your devotion to blue, which at that point, if Fast's Oracle is still on the battlefield, is uh, two. Right. So with Unexpectedly Absent, uh, before that trigger goes off, you tuck it back on top of their library. Uh, the trigger executes with Scry. You win the game if Scry is equal to or less than zero, uh, and it's one. And so you have another turn to do whatever you want uh and and they they don't win the game instantly which is really what you're trying to avoid and then if you have uh, another receptor they just do that over and over and we, again and you keep putting it back on top exactly and that is how i won <laughs> my game against uh daniel and it is get this guys not effective like, <laughs> just it is so much worse than just putting angel's grace on an isocraft scepter. That's a great Probably point. More. I mean, like, I guess against a generic field, unexpectedly absent is like a nice little value card. Yeah, it's genuinely uh, a good card. It's just a removal spell. Right. Yeah. However, I'm not bringing it in against the field. I'm right. bringing it in specifically against that one deck, and there's just a much better way of doing that thing. This Doesn't is funny. Matter if we're a plus. Um, so. Wrath of the Skies is, is one that obviously has been tearing up eternal formats all over the place. How does it feel in VRD? I I enjoyed it. Um, I think against this field, even though I drafted it uh, in anticipation of some uh, like token workshop combo, deck, maybe yeah, something along those lines. Um, I mean, all yeah, also against like. Like time bolt key oh, shenanigans sure. that takes care of that does it not right? it does. i mean it exiles the artifacts it destroys all the artifacts um it's a sorcery but besides that yeah right um and so you know if a if a board state in a like tinker urza's list gets wrath of the skies is tremendous sure uh and it's, this is I also like a great reason. Time. It's a great reason not to have ancient den and great furnace in your deck. That's a, now that we look at it. Yeah, yeah. I it, it just wasn't anything that I thought about uh, that I thought about doing. Yeah. Um, but you know, when it comes to this sideboarding tech kind of thing, uh, my philosophy is even if it's if I'm not taking it early enough, I'll do some weird kind of esoteric stuff where. I'm trying to merge the effectiveness of several answers. And Isochron Scepter, at least in my mind, is it is a way to accomplish my goal. Whether it's an effective way of actually winning the games and the matches is yet to be seen. Sure. Uh, but, for example, like putting a Red Elemental Blast on an Isochron Scepter, uh, like land mana crypt isochron scepter with reb on it uh against a blue control list that is waiting to get to its second mana uh to be able to cast counter spell and mana drain and time walk etc mm -hmm. it's that's a really effective uh stall state to introduce into the game when you're you're in a situation where you did draw the crypt, but you didn't draw the seasoned dungeoneer or the white plume. Um, maybe you're just like trying to build up the mana to get to Othari or something along those lines, uh, where it's like this isn't this isn't going to put them on an effective enough clock. 
Yeah. But uh, I'll get to draw enough cards uh, while they are taxing themselves mentally trying to figure out uh, how to get around this. One of your blue spells every turn doesn't get to work. So. Well, and you also, uh, I mean, you have enough. Um like density of threats first of all to push through that stuff but you also have a lot of interaction like you were saying you have tons of low cost interaction that lets you double spell yeah. pretty frequently yeah um the uh, bone crusher giant obviously shows up in but that's another um kind of quick interactive right uh spell that it's really effective um it also works nicely with balance oh um, sure which I always find a way to use uh, if, just as as frequently as possible. It's And I'm uh, sure you Teferi Protection balanced somebody at least, right? I, I did, yes. Good. Uh, Good. I, think I, did, I think I did it twice. I wasn't even really attempting to do that, um, but Teferi's Protection made the main board. Um, it, it was just a... Uh, what, there's a, a new card that came out in Bloomboro that kind of does what you want Teferi's Protection to do uh, for two mana. Okay. Um, I don't quite remember the name of that card, but uh, it does it does a job for three um, and uh, blanks a lot of uh, interaction that is very negative for my board state. So... I would just I would bring in balance in matchups where I'm taking out a lot of creatures to have specific uh, interaction, you know, like the Orm's Chant or the Unexpectedly Absent. And it just so happened that I got two of those bad boys in my... I think uh, when you are doing the commentary game, you will see Scott... Uh, in my the last game of the tournament, me versus Scott... Uh, I he does the time walk combo mm -hmm. uh, that is we now know is a Namba, but still an effective way to take two turns in a row. Sure. Or two additional turns in a row. Dawn's truce, thank you. Yes. Um, they get indestructible, so I don't think it actually works with balance, though. No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, yeah. But just I, I'm just talking about what with, it does yeah, with as a of interaction it is similar to to fairy's protection in that regard uh you know more efficiently costed as well and it fits under a scepter um, yeah exactly yep. uh obviously bloom actually bloomborough had come out at this time it's just I, I wasn't familiar with the cards um but i think i almost certainly would have gone with that over to fairy's protection if i had interesting uh, if i had known about it um but yeah in that last final game against scott uh, where he assembled that combo i was left there like oh so you're just taking infinite turns and you look down at my hand and it's balanced to fairy's protection and i'm just like no that's amazing so, and it is until your next turn so that is fun right yeah uh it I was i know he had to try to I win through uh he had to win through a, the one ring as well he had to win through the one trigger one ring trigger yeah. Uh, I mean, it was a, regardless of whether that, the wording of that combo was interpreted correctly by us, it, it, he had a very solid play. Totally, yeah. I, I, it's also one of those things where, like, clearly he drafted around the combo. That would have been very different if we played it differently. So I think I think that, like, we let it ride as it, as it is. Um, I, so, it's so, the same thing, to, in my mind, as Arcane Savant. And yeah. how that ruled, ruled the waves for... The uh, BRD four or whatever it was. Exactly, or a couple of them. It, it's uh, fine. So I guess final thoughts. Is there anything out on this uh, on your list you want to call out or like talk more about? Uh, yeah, I want to com call out Comet. For Comet's amazing. Never, <laughs> never rolling <laughs> things I wanted to roll, <laughs> and then against me, just sixes all day. <laughs> I, I mean, Comet is uh, an incredible card. I did not see it a lot. It's just, you know, you you spend an early pick on a card. Yeah. And uh, sometimes it just really doesn't show up. Uh, Comet was that one for me this draft, but that was totally 
the the results were were what I was hoping for, <laughs> regardless of whether Comet was the instigator. So that's funny. I was I was very pleased with it. It felt extremely powerful. Um, just the ability with the Soul Lands in the deck and with Mana Crypt and with Mox Diamond to, with alarming regularity, get out these, these threats that have to be answered like almost immediately. Yeah. And just to be able to follow them up with one, two more in each subsequent turn um, and continue to put the pressure on after they've expended their resources to try to uh, to stem the bleeding. It, I mean, in the games that I did lose, I, I believe you and I went uh, to three games, correct? We did, I'm pretty sure. And... I think you Imra cooled me one game, or uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I know I pushed through a top of a comet because you triggered comet twice, and then I beat you, and that was like I was very shocked that it happened, but it did. I don't know if it was Oath. I think we might have been Oath into Evercool. Yeah, that that sounds familiar. Um, and then in the other games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then I got run over. <laughs> and well, the... it was show, show and tell. You dropped an Imra cool. That was so brutal. And... And I dropped Palace uh, Jailer. a Palace Jailer, and that <laughs> it, it, that's a deflating it, moment. Like it, anytime, anytime you drop a show and tell, it, you're always like, ah, they could have something good. But when you're dropping an Emrakul, you rarely. Have it that was also in your head. it was also turn two. Uh, but yeah, that might be the most emasculating moment of my life. Uh, the game one was really disappointing though because I, I chose not to counter the mana crypt and then I was immediately taught that that was the stupidest idea in the world. So I learned for next time, you counter the mana crypt. So, uh, Yeah, for anybody else out there who's interested in the ins and outs of a red-white initiative list, always, always counter <laughs> the crypt because yeah. there is a there is a better than zero chance that they kept a one-land hand because they can just play turn they they know that even without drawing into a land initiative number one yep number one uh uh white plume adventurer gets one for you and uh beyond that it just lelia gut goblin rabble master whatever yep. um it's, yep i i, yeah. I got learned real well so thank you for that um, yeah. But yeah, your deck was amazing. Obviously, you won, uh, and I expect to see more red white coming out of Brandon in the future. No, I've done it. It's over. <laughs> Never again. I, I don't like. I I do end up playing a lot of like similar overlapping lists, and I'm trying to get away from that. Sure. Um, this list also is fairly linear. Yeah, um, it did feel that in, way. In terms of the draft. Uh, obviously there's a lot of battling back and forth uh, with, you know, Daniel taking Solitude, which is of course a card that I want, with uh, Steven taking um, uh, Stoneforge Mystic uh, is a card that the initiative list really likes um, because, you know, your double colorless mana can also just cast a Batter Skull. Totally. Uh, that kind of a uh, vibe. But um, I don't I don't know that I need to revisit it. My I do love winning these things, uh, and for a second win, uh, coming back mostly off of like a full year break, it was it it was very reaffirming. Um, nothing will top uh, getting to face Eric in the finals. Right, and just. Eric, if you're watching this, I go back at least once every <laughs> six months and watch his interview at the end of that uh, tournament where he says perhaps like the kindest words and most supportive words that anybody's ever said to me or about me in my life. And I just, I watch it and my heart is filled and I just, I cry tears of joy because that's how good it feels. And so nothing will ever top that. It does feel good to take down a VRD, 
especially against a bunch of talented people. Yeah, this was a stacked field, especially for presents. 